Okay, comma, as we begin a quick word about model organisms, the model organism approach has provided invaluable information and lots and lots of discoveries about how our biological world works and what's going on. However, there are limitations. So you can kind of think of all of the work that's gone on with Drosophila as like um, a very deep dive into all of the details of Drosophila. And because we understand it so well, we can extrapolate much of that to other arthropods, to other animals, and even to all life on Earth. However, if we want to know about differences between organisms, changes, evolution, what's the same, what's different, we need to broaden our sampling somewhat. So, it's an important endeavor to continue to work on, on model organisms, and there's been a lot that's come out of them. However, it's also important, especially if we're going to understand things in context, that we expand beyond the single organism and we look at other organisms. Now, some of that work will inevitably end up being confirmatory, saying, oh yeah, look, the spider does this the same way that the fruit fly does. But other things will discover differences. We may even discover, based on the phylogenetic position, some things that are similar but yet evolved convergently. And the only way we know that is if we have a good sampling of what's going on um, across many different taxa. Okay, so just be aware of that and be able to elaborate, or I'm sorry, to talk about and maybe you know answer a brief question about what the advantages and disadvantages of a model organism approach are. So with that said, we will do some t uh, looking at Drosophila and some of the things that have been discovered in Drosophila in this discussion, but we'll also make some generalizations and things that have been discovered as people have begun to examine other organisms beyond just the model organism. Okay, So if we're looking at comparative data sets, it's getting better. And so when I first put the slide together, there really were only two, and it's getting a little bit better, but, but still these two have by far the best comparative data sets. We've got arthropods, and we basically have chordates, or maybe even more particularly vertebrates. Okay, so we're going to spend this discussion talking about arthropods and the details of those. We'll spend the next one looking at the chordates, and in particular the vertebrates. All right, so arthropod is made up of four major groups, and you need to know each of these four groups. Okay, the chordates, we're going to concentrate on the vertebrates, although we will talk a little bit about some of the uh, cephalochordates and urochordates, but that's for the next lecture. So we're going to finish fit, uh, focus on these big four here. We have the myriapods, which includes centipedes like this house centipede and the millipedes. We've got the insects, which includes butterflies, many, many other groups. Insects are the most diverse and species group on Earth. We have the uh, chelicerates, including arachnids, but some other groups. And then we have the um, crustaceans. Okay, so just be aware of those four. Let's look at, at their relationships here in a little bit. Now for the genes, really hawk genes is where we have the most data, but now we're gathering more and more data for other comparative genes. So we're going to spend some time talking about hawk genes. And we want to do this in the context of the phylogenetics of these groups. Okay, so... This is an overview. There's some debate about relationships, even to this date, uh, among the chelicerates and the myriapods. Most people now think that the chelicerates are the closest relative of the remaining um, arthropods here, the insects and crustaceans. But notice something here. I put a crab and then this tadpole shrimp on separate groups. So this is a very key, important thing. Crustaceans are actually a paraphyletic group. It's not a valid taxonomic group. Some crustaceans are more closely related to insects than others. So to revise this, we've now called this entire group, including crustaceans, paraphyletic, and the insects, pancrustacea. Okay, so we've got the myriapods, we've got the chelicerates, we have the paraphyletic group crustaceans, again, not a valid taxonomic group, and then we have the hexapods or the insects. Okay, and so this group is called pancrustaceous. So be familiar with these terms, and that crustaceans and insects are their own are their cl are closely related to each other, but that some crustaceans are more closely related to insects than others. Okay, the outgroup for the arthropods we've mentioned this previously, but you need to know it. We'll talk about it in a little bit more detail now. Are the velvet worms? 
velvet worms are externally segmented. Uh, this group, Anacophora, was once much more diverse, and so we have uh, examples of representatives from the fossil record, and there were many, many marine representatives of the uh, Anacophora. Today, there are only a handful of species, and they are found primarily in tropical, but some in um, uh, temperate rainforest also, where it stays uh, wet. Uh, and so they're all terrestrial today, uh, despite having uh, some ancient marine diversity. Fairly simple body plan, okay, so you need to be aware of this. This is the ancestral body plan for all of the crustaceans. They only have two distinct regions, the head, which contains an antenna and some other sensory organs, and then this homonymous trunk. So that's a really good vocabulary word you should know. Homonymous means uh, roughly the same one segment after the other look very, very similar. So if I looked at the first uh, trunk segment, the second trunk segment, third, and so on down the line, they'd all be pretty comparable. You know, a few differences in size, maybe some slight differences, but not much. This is both externally and internally. So there are repeated muscle segments, there are repeated uh, pulsatory organs on the um, circulatory system, and they look much the same from one segment to the next. Okay, segment number, or uh, group number two that you need to be aware of uh, are the myriapods. And this is the first arthropod group we're going to talk about. So house centipedes, other centipedes, some of them get quite large. I think it's kind of cool when you have a centipede that's big enough to prey on vertebrates. Uh, that's unusual. But um, the millipedes are part of this group also. And these organisms have the same basic body plan as the Anacophora. They have a head that's very different and distinct, a little bit more defined, complex sensory organs. So well-formed eyes, uh, mandibles, antenna, um, other sensory organs there also. And then they have a homonymous trunk, a leg on each segment. And there is some variation. This is the main difference between centipedes and millipedes. Um, there is no, the names are a little bit misleading. There's actually no centipede that has 100 legs. There's some that get up into the 40s and 50s. And there's no millipede that has a thousand leg, although there are some that get up into the hundreds. So the names are a little bit misleading. But the main difference is um, centipedes have a single leg on each of their trunk segments, whereas millipedes have two pairs of legs. So a single pair of legs for centipedes and two pair of legs on each segment for the millipedes. Okay, the next group we're going to talk about are the crustaceans. Crustaceans are a very, very diverse group primarily in the marine and freshwater environment, although there are terrestrial crustaceans, right? So you're familiar with lobsters, crabs, probably even barnacles, but barnacles are crustaceans also. There are lots of other groups. Some of them have this same body plan as the ancestor ones, so they've maintained that ancestral body plan, a head and a homonymous trunk. Others, though, have very highly modified body plans and kind of the key for the crustaceans is there is no single body plan. Some of them maintain the ancestral one, some of them have very, very highly modified body plans like barnacles and these freshwater crustaceans here. Um, some of them get quite large, uh, some of them are parasites, so this is a parasite on a fish, a little isopod crustacean that actually starts out as a larva and grows and grows by eating the food that's being eaten by this guy and he also chews away and eats part of the tongue and just kind of hangs out there in the mouth. So incredibly interesting uh, and a very wide and diverse group of organisms. The main group of terrestrial isopods, I'm sorry, terrestrial crustaceans are the isopods also. And the isopods have these marine, many marine forms also, but they have these terrestrial ones. You maybe know them more commonly as potato bugs, as sow bugs, roly polies, pill bugs. It's one of those groups where there's tons of common names, but they're actually a terrestrial crustacean. Okay, And some crustaceans have an incredibly diverse array of appendages, and we talked about this in an earlier discussion, how they're kind of like the Swiss army knives of um, the arthropod world. So we would have a head segment with all of these different various sensory organs on it, a, um, actually two pairs of antenna, mouth parts, eyes, and all the other things that go along with the head, a uh, cephalothorax, kind of a trunk region, uh, what looks a little bit like the abdomen here, what um, they're calling 
um, that, that are often called the tail, but may have break up, broken up into these many parts. And you don't need to spend time memorizing this, but you should know that crustaceans have the most diverse from a fairly simple ancestral form to a very, very complex form with many different types of bodies. So there is no single crustacean body plan. Okay, the next group we're going to talk about are the chelicerates. Okay, and the chelicerates, the name literally means the slicing mouth parts. Um, the chelicerates uh, include groups that you're very, very familiar with, but also lots of other groups that are less commonly known and also many extinct groups. So the trilobites dominated uh, the many ecosystems in the Paleozoic era. Today there are a few marine chelicerates left, so um, horseshoe crabs are one of the marine chelicerates. But most chelicerates now are on land, so we've got ticks and mites, and we have other arachnids. This is a, uh, a whip scorpion. Uh, you may be familiar with this from the Harry Potter movies. Um, and so here we have Ron Weasley, right, with a, a big scary chelicerate. This is a little bit of an exaggeration. They get close to this size, but really not quite this big. Uh, these guys look very, very scary. They can give a little bit of a bite, but they're actually rather harmless. And then, of course, the biggest group that I don't have pictured here, you guys are already familiar with, are the spiders. And all of the chelicerates have the same basic body plan. They have two basic body regions. They have a prosoma, which is kind of like a head and a thorax combined together. So the head with the mouth parts, and then the thorax with all of the legs on it. That uh, makes up the prosoma. And then the opisthosoma looks a little bit like what we call the abdomen in the insects. So no appendages on it, but there are respiratory organs and then other structures, reproductive structures internally, lots of other structures. But that's the basic body plan for the uh, chelicerates. And then finally, the insects, or technically hexapoda. So insects um, are a subgroup within the hexapods. There are some other groups also that are included. So we'll call them hexapods more generally, but just recognize that that's roughly equivalent to the group Insecta. And these have this very classic body form, you probably learned it even as a small child, right? So they've got a head, a thorax with three pairs of legs, and then an abdomen without any appendages, although that's a little bit of an exaggeration. Some of the uh, basal hexapods like the silverfish here and these columbula do have some appendages on their uh, abdomen. But most of the species of insects have no appendages at all in their abdomen. Okay, so these three basic major body regions, and then also a major thing, although this only applies to a subgroup of insects, is that wings evolve. So they were the very first organisms on Earth to evolve flight. It happened um, probably about 450 to 400 million years ago. Although there's some debate about that. We don't have a very extensive fossil record, but surely by 400 million years ago, we had flying insects. And today they are the most diverse group. And so these columbula and silverfish uh, are descended from groups that broke off before wings evolved. Now, all arthropods have several features in common, and we're gonna talk about these features and then look at the genetic control of them, just kind of in brief overview. So one of the primary, most obvious characteristics of the arthropods are uh, their segments. So they have individual segments and then diversification of those segments. So thoracic segments are different than abdominal segments. And this contrasts with the homonymous trunk segments like we looked at with the onychophora and with the myriapods. Okay? And so as people began to explore this, they realized it was probably a very, very early evolved. In fact, we know now that segmentation goes back even pre-arthropods. But in the arthropods, there's a very, very conserved mechanism of segmentation. So the gene that controls segmentation in insects is the same gene as in crustaceans, as in myriapods, as in chelicerates. And the main gene that does this is engrailed, uh, abbreviated EN for short. So engrailed is the conserved arthropod method for building segments. And so engrailed comes on fairly early in development. Timing and order in which it comes on is slightly different in different groups, but it's still the same uh, gene. So whether you're a fruit fly, a grasshopper, these insects, a crayfish, centipede, or a mite, you're going to express engrailed as a signal for where the boundary is for each of those individual segments. Okay. However, there have also been other genes that have been recruited to do things differently in some arthropods. So fits in fruit flies, notch in some of the other arthropods, 
and even skipped or Eve all have now a very early and important role in segmentation, but it's not universal. And Grail is kind of the one universal gene that unites all of the arthropods. Okay, And so we can see changes in how these genes are regulated, like hunchback and how it's turned on. Here's an example. In the fruit fly, hunchback is turned on by Bicoid, this very early maternal gene, but it's repressed by Nanos, which is another maternal gene that's expressed in the posterior area. And so both of those together have this kind of um, antagonistic impact on hunchback. However, in a beetle, which is actually fairly closely related to flies when we're looking at the grand scheme of arthropods, we don't have a bicoid gene. And so this is a new function that's very, very early on and unique for Drosophila. So this kind of points out the limitations of the Drosophila, or of the model organism approach. If you only looked at Drosophila, then you might make an extrapolation like, oh, this is how early segmentation is done in insects. Bicoid controls hunchback, which has an impact on even skipped in the end uh, in grail. But that is a very n relatively newly evolved structure just in the higher flies. And other insects don't share that. Okay? So just be aware that there can be lots of changes despite this external um, similarity in, in structure and, and some genetic similarity. Okay? So here's Bicoid, this new gene. Again, remember, it is a duplicated Hox gene that is no longer functioning at the same level as a Hox gene. It's kind of this you know, fifth level down in the cascade of development. It's actually been moved to the very first and is a maternally in, uh, expressed gene. Okay. Now, another very critical gene, and we've already talked about these, and, and you know some of this story already, we're gonna expand about it. UBX is kind of like a jack of all trades for um, uh, the arthropods and where segment differentiation occurs. So in insects, UBX helps to define the transition between the thorax and the abdomen. If you remember the Lewis et al. paper, there was, a paper, there was uh, some research that looked at that in quite a lot of detail. It's actually UBX and abdominal A together, okay? However, in the ancestor, the crustacean, UBX doesn't define the abdomen. It's expressed throughout this area where we grow legs. So notice here, if we have UBX and abdominal A together, we don't grow legs. And so that represents that transition, a, a, a fairly short number of steps to transition towards this very successful insect body plan. So it's a great example of a, of a change in the developmental genes, a fairly simple change actually, the developmental genes resulting in a massive change in um, the body plan. See, crustaceans don't do that. Myriapods, similar, UBX and abdominal A are kind of both expressed together and they don't repress appendage development. However, in chelicerates, they play a little bit of a different role. They themselves are, are not necessary for a repression of leg growth and appendage growth, but they can do it. So they are sufficient together, but not necessary. And then in the on the coffer, we only have there that basically these small, not even really that important posterior genes. So these posterior genes have expanded and gained much more importance and diversity across arthropods. So just kind of review that story and, and know the general outlines of that. UBX also plays some roles in some unexpected areas. So we typically think of it as this kind of abdomen or posterior part of the body development, but can also play a role in crustaceans here at the transition from the, um, sorry, right up here, at the transition from the mouth parts to the maxilliped. Now, the maxilliped is kind of, as its name implies, is kind of a hybrid appendage. Looks a little bit like a mouth part in many groups is used to help manipulate food and grab food, but it also has features that are in common with the legs. So it's kind of this hybrid one. And notice that where the uh, maxilliped forms, which is right here on T1, that that is basically UBX all on its own. So UBX helps to uh, define that and defines that region of the maxilliped, okay? So we can see this boundary, although it's changed somewhat. We have um, here on T1, a maxilliped there. Here in the brachiopod, it's really much more similar to the other appendages. So it's a diverse feature. We have two maxillipeds in, um, this is the lobster, um, and then three in some others. So uh, this has changed, but that basic maxilliped formation is still defined by UBX. Okay, now the head is also patterned by Hox gene with quite a bit of variation. And I'm not going to spend time or expect you to take the time to learn any one of these. 
But notice that we have very different layouts for these different types of heads. And the head in insects is roughly the same, although there are modifications to the mouth parts, but roughly the same number of segments and the same basic parts uh, across most of the insects. And so we have these many different de regions defined. And so again, don't take time to memorize these, but what I do want you to, do, to look at is the same basic pattern that we talked about earlier in the semester, where we have multiple genes with various levels of overlap that allow us to define many different parts of the body. So we can define an antennal region, which basically doesn't express Hox genes in insects. We have this uh, kind of vestigial area that's not really that important, but it does form part of the developing head that is defined by labial and a little bit of proboscopedia. Then we have the mandible that's defined by proboscopedia and deform, but proboscopedia at low levels. And then the maxilla that's defined by proboscopedia defined and a little bit of sex combs reduced in the posterior end. So all these different overlaps lead to incredible amounts of different developmental pathways and ending up with different developmental um, outcomes. So again, just one example, you don't need to spend time memorizing it, but notice we have similar things with slightly different outcomes for the rest of the arthropods. So we end up with very, very complex patterns, but notice how um, the form correlates with the different expression regions. All right, that right wraps up arthropods, kind of short and sweet. Um, there is a little bit of information that will come from paper number eight. I will post outlines on Thursday sometime near the end of the day for both paper number seven and paper number eight. They'll just be written outlines with questions for you to highlight and look at. Hopefully you've read paper seven. If not, read it sometime um, this weekend. The material from that, from what's on those outlines, will be fair game for exam number two.